Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. This morning we're going to be looking at some things from the Word of God about training. How many of you in here have ever trained for something, been trained for something, or trained someone else? I would dare say everybody. Um, you know, you've, you've trained for, in reality, many things. Um, I think that everybody in the room, now that Mackenzie's left, has been potty trained, right? <laughs> so you've all received some kind of training. And the fact of the matter is we've been trained for a lot of things. Somebody tell me something that you have been trained for. War. Military. Military. Welding. What else? Careers. Sports. Careers. You've been trained for careers. Uh, okay. First aid. First aid. Okay. Teach God's word. To teach God's word. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now tell me something that you have trained yourself to do. Play guitar. Play guitar. Read them. Play Cook. ukulele. Yeah. Play ukulele. Drums. Drums. A lot of self-taught musicians. <laughs> now tell me something that you have been trained, uh, that, trained that you have trained someone to do. Judo or you sports. somebody to do judo or sports. Driving. Yeah, judo is not a sport. It is. Uh, okay. <laughs> Driving. Driving. Anything else? Employees at work. Employees at work. Mechanic, yeah. okay. Firearms. Firearms, all right. So, <laughs> we see the training is an integral part of life, right? right? You've been trained to do a job at times. You've been trained in sports. You've trained other people in some of these things. You perhaps <clears throat> trained yourself to do things. Um, and all of these things are important parts of life. They're all good things to learn and to be trained in. But life consists more of the careers that we're trained to do. It consists of things greater than the sports that we play or the musical instruments that we play. Those are all wonderful. But there's something greater, there's something higher that we are called to be trained in. Some of that training is training that we receive. Some of that training is training that we continue to do ourselves. And some of that training is training that we give to others. But all of this training that I'm talking about falls into the category of the things of God. And those are the most important areas of training and something worthwhile to understand from God's Word. To understand what it is that God would have us to be trained in. What training we should continue to do, and what training we should give to others. To understand why we train, and what we are training for ultimately. What is the ultimate goal of that training? And God's Word speaks about all of these things. To begin, it's important to understand the training process. There's a difference between teaching and training, right? Um, if you are going to train, if you're going to coach, and that's a form of training, a child to play baseball, you would do more than just teach him about the game. Right? <laughs> you do more than just say, okay, now the way this works is there's a pitcher and he throws the ball and then somebody back. If he's going to play the game, you've actually got to train <clears throat> him. If he's going to pitch, you're going to have to show him how to grip that ball. And he's going to actually 
throw it. And then you're going to watch and see what he's doing right and what he's doing wrong. And if he's, he probably won't do it perfect the first time. And you will teach him how to, you know, do it right. You'll make corrections there, practical corrections. And as you're going on with that training, you may need to even reteach him some things. And that would be that correction that's involved in it. Same way when it comes later on with that child in their life that perhaps you would train them how to drive a car. I, I trained all three of my kids to drive a car. Um, and <laughs> they're doing pretty good. It was more than teaching, right? You don't just say, okay, you know, here's how it works and, you know, now go get your license and, and that's it. But it's training. It's actually working with them. And there is instruction involved in training. And then there is the practice of that instruction, corrections that are made along the way until you reach a degree of mastery. And that's what you do when you're training someone. You want to carry it all the way through until they've mastered that task. If you were a, if you're going to become a doctor, that would take more than a short time to be trained to do that, right? You wouldn't want a doctor who, how long have you been doing this? Well, it's been about, about a week or so now. Oh, yeah. you, know, I, you know, took a couple of classes and I think I'm ready to go. No, you want that doctor to be well trained. Of course, they go through years of instruction, right? And then they go through even more years of practice. Where, you know, the first time they do an operation, somebody's right there showing them what to do. And then they do it. And before, and, and they, they practice on people that aren't even living before they get to do it on somebody that is, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of these things. Um, it's better that it's that way, not the other <laughs> way around, right? Better that it's not the guy living and then he's. And then after years of practice, then they're ready when they've mastered it to do it on their own. The more difficult the task, the more important of what is at stake, then the more training that is required. And all of this is true as well when we get to the spiritual realm. I told you Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians 6, we have a category of life where some of us, I guess all of us, have received training. Uh, not necessarily that we've been trained in the way I do <clears throat> that this is talking about, but nonetheless, God encourages that this is where training would start. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, who would like to read that? Dylan, go ahead. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So one category of life the training takes place in is the training of a child. To bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Bring them up, that's training them. In the nurture, which is training itself. Nurture, we'll see and we'll understand more about that in a second here. But nurture is the full instruction, the full instruction of the Lord. And admonition is that second part of the training. It's that continuing to watch over them until they achieve the mastery of it. To bring up a child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord takes training. To raise a child is more than just teaching them something. If you work with children, if you have children of your own, or if you've ever worked with child, you, a child, you've probably come to realize that it takes more than just one telling them of something to get them to, to learn it. Okay? <laughs> you have to tell them a lesson more than once. You have to repeat that lesson over and over again. Because that's what's involved in training. And that's an important area of training for us to do when we have children. But I also want you to look at it to understand the overall principle of what is involved in training. It takes years to train a child. 
It takes many years to train them and to get them to the point where they're prepared for life. That's what you're training a child to do, right? You're not just training them in one area of life. You're not just training them in one task. But you are preparing them for life in every way. That's what God would have us to do as parents. And that involves many different aspects of it. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. The word nurture that's used in Ephesians 6, 4, that parents are to bring up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, is also used in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where it's translated instruction in verse 16. Read it. Would you read that verse? Yep, verse 16. Mm -hmm. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, all scripture is profitable for three things. Doctrine. What else? Reproof. What else? Correction. And those three together are instruction in righteousness. Same word as nurture. It's instruction, and instruction in righteousness takes all three of those, doctrine, reproof, correction. It's a training process. It's giving the doctrine. It's teaching. But then it's watching to see that the practical application of that teaching is right. And if need be, then to correct, to go back and to reteach, to repeat that lesson over and over again. Look at Proverbs chapter 27. When it comes to us receiving training, the training that God would have us receive from his word, it requires not just hearing something once, but being instructed again and again. It requires us practicing it and looking to see if we're doing it right and seeking the coaching of others, the leadership of others to help to see that we're doing it right. And then it requires also, at times, the reteaching, the correction. It takes doing those things again and again in every category of life. And that's what's involved in us receiving training. In Proverbs 27, Grace, would you read verse 17? Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron sharpeneth iron, <clears throat> so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. We do that for one another in the body of Christ. We help sharpen one another just as iron sharpens iron. If you want to sharpen a knife, you know how you do it? You rub it against a stone or something even harder than it. And by doing that over and over again, that's how you sharpen a knife. It's doing it again and again. That's what training is. Training is that doing it over and over again until you achieve the mastery of it. We had some people here who said they received training or trained themselves in playing music. The first time you tried to play that instrument, did you get it down just like that? No. You had to do it over and over again, right? You had to practice. <clears throat> um, some instruments, you know, like drums, you know, you can bang on those things and, you know, you're banging on it and it still sounds like something. Um, Maybe a guitar or ukulele, it still sounds like something. Some instruments, like a, tr a trumpet, I think of. If you ever listen to somebody trying to learn how to play a trumpet, um, yes, you know. <laughs> you want to make sure that you're in another part of the house. Because, you know, initially, boy, that's just doesn't sound like anything you want to hear, right? And yet, by doing it over and over and over again, finally, if you keep working at it and you've got that instruction and somebody that's saying, okay, you know, the problem here is, you know, you need to, I don't know how to play 
the trumpet, so I can't tell you. But, you know, you need to form your mouth differently. You need to do whatever you need to do to get the right sound out of it. And then you try that, and you get the hang of it eventually. That's training. That's training. This process is something that is like to what we have to do with the Word of God. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Too often, Christians mistake having heard something for having been trained in it. It's not enough to just be taught something. If we're going to really reap the benefit of that instruction, it takes hearing it and then endeavoring to do it and then being corrected, getting more instruction, repeating it and practicing it over and over and over again until we achieve mastery at it. Suppose you picked up a trumpet once and you tried to play it. <laughs> And you didn't do it well, right? And you put it on the shelf, and then, you know, maybe a week later, you tried it again. And you're still not quite playing, you know. I know. Feel so good by Chuck, what's his name? Mangio. Yeah. You don't quite sound like that. <clears throat> so then you put it away, and you pick it up two months later, and you still don't sound that way. And you put it away, and a year later, you pick it up. Do you think you'll sound like it now? No. no. So the problem is that this thing just can't be played, right? No. no. The problem is, you you know, whatever instruction you received just was wrong necessarily, right? No. 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 The problem is you just didn't stay with it enough to receive the mastery of it, to, to achieve it, to practice it, to do those repeated lessons. You see, there are principles in God's Word that we learn, and they're simple. It's really simple. It's simpler than playing a trumpet. Things like believing. Things like the renewing of the mind. Principles in God's Word that we receive instruction on. But just hearing those things, hearing those simple truths, those wonderful principles, is not enough for us to see the result. We have to practice them, and we have to work at it until we achieve the mastery of it. You understand? When it comes to the things of God, it requires training. It requires effort. There's effort involved in being trained for anything, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> and it takes effort, and it takes repeated lessons. In Second Peter chapter 1, who else would like to read this morning? Mary Jo, read verses 12 and 13, and then 15. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. What's the word that you keep hearing in there? Remembrance. Remembrance. He said, I won't be negligent, you see. Peter had a position of leadership in the body of Christ. He had a responsibility. And his he would not be negligent to that responsibility of always putting them in remembrance of certain things, even though they already knew them. Even though they already knew them. You know, I dare say there's a most man, a good deal of you in this room that already know the things that I'm sharing with you this morning. And yet, we all need to be reminded of them. We all need to be reminded of the Word of God over and over again. You know, the funny thing about when it comes to the things of God is we have to actually seek out learning those things and being trained in them. We have to choose to do that. God won't put it, he won't force it upon you. He won't try to manipulate you. The adversary will, but God will never do that. 
And throughout life, we need to be reminded again and again. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4, and Mike, would you read verse 6? First Timothy, verse, chapter 4, verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, mm. nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Here again, <clears throat> there is that training in, that's being done by someone else. Timothy is given a responsibility to remind people, to always put them in remembrance of certain things. You see, that's what we need to do. We need to be reminded over and over again, and the responsibility of those who teach, those who are those you know responsible to share God's word, is to remind over and over again. When it comes to training, some training is received from others. Some training we do ourselves. And then, ultimately, we are also to teach and to, to train others as well. God's called all of us, ultimately, to do that. It's like, as a, as a person, you were trained by your parents to do certain things. And then, when you have kids, you're going to train them as well. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. It says, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. <clears throat> bodily exercise profits little. When it comes to training, one thing that we might train ourselves in is bodily exercise. It's like when I was in college, I actually had a course in, it was called weight training, it was weightlifting, which has got to be like one of the silliest ideas for a college course ever, right? It's like, I took that because the one that was about how to walk and chew gum at the same time is like too hard to do. You know, weight training, a college course, pick up bar, lift up. <laughs> But, you know, it actually involved more than that. It was instruction on how to do it in a way that you were going to get the maximum benefit from it, not hurt yourself, and so forth. And <clears throat> I took that, you know, and it was weight training. They didn't just teach us, but you actually went in every day and, and you lifted weights. And you did this, and you it was work. It was hard work. You know, I'd come out of there. I remember, like, the first class I came out of, we went from there, me and my roommate, who also took the class, to get something to eat. And I got a sandwich and a shake, and I could barely lift that shake off the table <laughs> because it had been hard work. Um, but that hard work produced benefit. You know, if you are trying to get the benefit of bodily exercise, and um, you, you know, can lift... You could lift 150 pounds, but instead all you lift is 10 pounds. You're not going to get much benefit of it, are you? You have to push yourself. You have to put in real effort. You have to work really hard. And when you do that, then, you get results. It says bodily exercise profiteth little. And that little is really meaning a short time. I did that exercise back at that time, and it profited me for some period of time. And then, you know, I kept up doing the, that for a while, and then I probably went, you know, a couple of years of not doing it, and I started to lose the benefit of that. And then I did it again faithfully for a while, and I got the benefit of that, and then, you know, again, a 
period of time where I didn't. And it's been sort of an on and off. You know, you do it for a year, you don't do it for a year, you do it for a couple of years, you don't do it for 10 or 20. You do it for <laughs> I can't tell. <laughs> It doesn't last, you know, all that long. It lasts a while, but not all that long. But it says that godliness, that does last, right? Having promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. We are to exercise ourselves unto godliness. <clears throat> And that means that we would put in that self-discipline, that effort, that training into those things that would help us, that would enable us to have a true and vital relationship with God as our Father. That's what godliness is. Godliness is, is not religion. It's the opposite of religion. It's not about ritual. It's not about just you know doing certain things because it's the right thing to do. It's about developing a close, vital, personal relationship with God. So that you see God in your life. So that you see the power of God evidenced in your life. So that you're walking with God and you're walking in the fullness of that relationship. Do you want the things that that godliness can bring? It can bring love, joy, peace. Goodness, meekness, temperance, mm -hmm. faith. What am I leaving out? Long suffering. I don't really like that one. <laughs> no, Long suffering's patience. Um, if you want those qualities, if you want that fruit in your life, then it comes from that relationship with God. You can't have that in your life by just having once heard about it. You can't have that unless you're willing to put in the work, unless you're willing to exercise. Here's the interesting thing about exercise, and I say it's work. It is work, but you know what? It's not so much when it comes to even bodily exercise, the intensity of the work as much as the faithfulness to it. You know that? It's faithfulness. You can go out, I could go out, to, no, I can't. <laughs> Mike could go out today <laughs> and run three miles. Okay. And if he didn't do that again for the next three years, he wouldn't get much benefit out of it. On the other hand, if he went out today and just walked three miles, but he did that again tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day, he'd get tremendous benefit from it. It's not the intensity as much as the faithfulness. You get that? Yeah. Faithfulness is the key. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Exercise is just that doing it over and over again. I could sit down and do, you know, the next two hours study my Bible and do the most, you know, just intense study of it. And that would give me a little benefit, but it wouldn't last me long. If I didn't the next day read my Bible, and I do better by just faithful habits of reading my Bible, praying faithfully, bringing my mind back to the Word of God than anything else. It's in the faithfulness. Look at Philippians chapter 3. When it comes to this training, Philippians 3, verse 13, tells us the ultimate goal of why we train. In verse 13, it says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended or to have attained, to have arrived. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Life is likened unto an athletic contest in many places in the New Testament and the epistles. 
And here is one of those places where life is compared to a race. And Paul says that he pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. He's pressing toward that finish line, giving everything he's got so that he can achieve that prize. <clears throat> I recently have been reading a book <clears throat> about uh, a man named Louis Zamperini. It's a book called Unbroken. Great book. And <clears throat> really, I won't get into all the whole book, but this is a man who he ended up competing in the 1936 Olympics, the same Olympics that Jesse Owens competed in. And if it hadn't been for World War II, he would have been competing in the next Olympics, 1942, and in all likelihood would have been the first man to break the four-minute mile. Um, everybody expected. Instead, the war broke out, he got you know, shot down, so on and so forth. Now, you know, he worked really hard in training for that. Why? What did he get out of it? Jesse Owens worked really hard and won many, many medals. Do you think that those medals had such financial value that that's what he was doing it for? You know, now you can say now that Olympic athletes, they've got endorsements, and you know, but nobody was slapping a pair of Nikes on Jesse Owens' feet or Louis Zamperini's feet. Nobody was giving him TV commercials or any of that stuff. They weren't doing it for endorsements. They were doing it for that achievement. That recognition that they were the greatest in the world at that thing. We press toward the mark for the prize of the high calm. There is a day when we will stand before God. When we will stand before God to be rewarded as well. And in life, the ultimate goal would be that we would live life so that we would be found well-pleasing in his sight. That we live life for God. And that it's not just that we do things for our own benefit, although it will benefit us. Sure, having peace in our life is great to have. Having joy is something that we would want. But even more than that, even beyond that, even beyond whatever present self-satisfaction or gratification we derive from doing the work and doing those things that are well-pleasing in his sight. The goal would be that recognition that God could say, this is a beloved son in whom I am well-pleased. That's certainly what Paul competed for. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Here again in 1 Corinthians 9, we see that life is a spiritual contest. And that just like those athletic contests that people compete in, that we're to put out all of our effort, all of that effort in training and self-discipline so that we could arrive at that point of winning. Who would like to read? Mike, read verse 24 through 27, please. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Okay. That translation in place is a little bit difficult, and I want to read to you um, another translation of it. This is from A Journey Through the Acts and Epistles. It's uh, Reverend Walter Cummins' working translation. 
beginning in verse 24, and you can read, kind of follow along in the King James as I'm reading this. Do you, not, do you not know that all of those who run in a race certainly do run, but only one receives the prize? Everybody runs, but only one person wins, right? Run in such a manner that you may win. Everyone who c competes in a contest exercises self-control in all things. That word temperate is exercising self-control mm -hmm. in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible prize. Therefore I run in this manner, not as with uncertainty. I box in this manner, not as punching the air. I beat my body and treat it as a slave, lest by some means, after the heralding to others, I myself should be rejected from the competition. <clears throat> and that's a um, sort of a literal according to usage translation. There's some interesting words in there. Words like temperate, exercising self-control. That's what training involves. You discipline yourself. Mm -hmm. Another interesting word in there is when it says, I, in verse 27, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Keep under my body. Keep under means to discipline through hardship. Walter translated, beat my body. It's, you know, the emphasis there is that it is it's working hard at this. You know, when you're training, boy, you work hard at it and bring it into subjection. And that word subjection, that one's a real interesting. Um, I'll give you actually the Greek on this one because I think some of you will appreciate it. It's doula gogeo. Anybody recognize the root word in there? Doula, or, which is a form of do loves, which is someone who through their freedom of will chooses to, out of love, be a slave to someone else. <clears throat> in the biblical times, if you had a servant, they could only serve, the law required that they would only be in service for a certain period of time, like seven years, six years actually, because on the seventh they'd be free. And then if they wanted to, out of love, because they so loved the master, they could choose by their free will to continue to serve. Here it says that we are to bring our bodies under subjection, under slavery. You see, <clears throat> we choose by our freedom of will to make ourselves a servant to the things of God. Yeah. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. Sherry, would you read verse 12? Let not sin therefore reign in the mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Now verses 15 to 18. What then? Shall we sin, because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. You see, ultimately, <clears throat> we are either going to be servants, which is that word doulos, 
slaves to either sin or righteousness. In life, we are either going to serve the things of the world, the things of the flesh, or we are going to serve the things of God. And we are called to have the self-discipline, the self-control to serve the things of God. If we don't exercise that self-control, then ultimately the things that we will be enslaved to are the things of sin. In that verse, in that section we read in 1 Corinthians, it said that when I have preached to others, I bring my body into subjection, into slavery, lest that when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway or found unworthy of the competition. We have to exercise that self-discipline so that we are worthy, so that we ourselves can be worthy at the time of that standing before God. There's a relationship in life that we have to understand, and that is that the body has to be subject to the mind and the mind to the spirit. Look at verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians 6. Verse 12, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not what? Expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. All things are lawful. We're free. We are free to do what we want, but not all things are expedient. And Paul said that he was not willing to be brought under the power of any. You see, I talked about the body being subject to the mind and the mind being subject to the spirit. You may find this shocking to hear, but some people actually have the body at times rule the mind. <laughs> Now, that probably has never happened. <laughs> you know, where the body says, you know, I'd like to eat 20 Snickers bars. And the mind says, I don't think that's a good idea. And the body says, no, I, I'd really like that. So the mind says, well, you know, the body wants it. i got to go along with it. Or the body tells the mind something else, some other desire that the body has. And the mind says, eh, I don't think that's really a good idea. But the body says, I really want it. And so the body's in control. The body's in charge. And the mind goes along. It can't be that way if we're going to really have what we really want out of life. Now, you can, are you free to do that? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Yeah, sure. Prove it on a daily basis. <laughs> I'm free to do that, but it's not necessarily expedient, is it? It's not necessarily profitable for me to do that. You see, in life, God gives us the freedom. He doesn't control us. He's not going to force you. We choose what we do with our lives. It's our choice. And it takes our effort of will, self-control, self-control. You do it. You do it. You take charge. You take responsibility. God won't do it for you. God won't force it upon you. And God doesn't say you just pray about it. He says you do it. Okay. You renew your mind. You put off the old man. You put on the new man. You putting away lying, speak every man truth to this neighbor. You, you know, steal no more, but rather working with your hands, um, the thing which is good that you may have to give to him that need it. You know, you choose to do all of those things. You choose to have your mind do what 
have control of your body and you have your mind subjected to your spirit, the spirit of God. Where even if the mind, even if the mind wants to go a different way, the spirit of God would have greater say. So if my mind says, you know, that person did me wrong and I, I want to get back at them. Instead, that mind's subject to the spirit of God that's saying, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You see, that is the everyday discipline, self-control that we're called to have. In Galatians chapter 5, the word temperance is used. We saw it as temperate in um, Corinthians, right? Temperate in all things, right? In Galatians chapter 5, another variation of that word is used. And temperance, you know, temperance isn't just a movement to get rid of alcohol. Yeah. Temperance movement, that's what it was, you know. By the way, if you don't know, the, the term teetotaler, that's where it comes from, the temperance movement. A lot of people... It's just a little interesting tidbit I won't charge you extra for. Um, a lot of people think the term teetotaler means that you drank tea. But that's not what it means. The guy that doesn't drink, they say they used to say he's a teetotaler. Um, it goes back to the temperance movement. If you join the temperance movement, they put down your name in a, in a log and they put a T next to it. And then they total up the number of T's after a meeting. Okay? How many people they converted to the temperance movement? Teetotaler. Wow. <clears throat> temperance movement was that people would exercise some control when it came to drinking. It actually wasn't originally for the idea of prohibition, getting rid of all together. It was just to have a little self-control when it came to it. You know, to not be filled with wine wherein there is excess. Um, you know, to stop after that, you know, second, third drink instead of the 30th or 40th or whatever. <laughs> temperance. Temperance is self-control. Who's in Galatians 5? I am. Yeah. Okay, read that section of the fruit of the Spirit. Right. Okay. In verse, verse, chapter 5, verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Those are all fruit of the Spirit. And that's the great thing about it, is actually as you begin doing it, you get more of it. You see? Mm -hmm. You get that fruit of actually having more self-control as you begin to exercise self-control. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It's one when people read the fruit of the Spirit. I don't know if it's one of those first ones they grab at, you know. Love, joy, peace. Yeah, I, I want that. Love, joy, peace. You don't, you know, temperance. No, long-suffering. Eh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but this is all fruit of the Spirit. This is all the benefit that we get as we begin to exercise ourselves unto godliness as we begin to train in that area. You see, we need to exercise self-control in every category of life. And I don't just mean things like drinking or, you know, whatever else, you know, what other, other sin you want to put in its place there in your mind. But I'm talking about that moment-by-moment -moment obedience to do the word, to think the word, to walk in his steps, to be Christ's life. Do I choose to have the fear that the rest of the world has, or do I choose to be peaceful and trust in God? Do I choose to let this thing just get under my skin, you know, or do I choose to instead bring my mind back to the word? Uh, I've told this before and reminded Dylan and I were talking about this a week or so ago. Um, not that he had a special problem. <laughs> we were talking about temperance, the idea of being temperate and exercising that control in every way. And I told the story about how when I was a little kid, we'd stop at my grandmother's every week on Sunday. And my grandmother who had the responsibility of being a caregiver for her mother, who at this point was in her 80s, would talk about how her mother just worried about it. 
And she'd say, you know, she just worries about everything and she's not happy unless she's got something to worry about. If I get to be that way when I'm her age, somebody just shoot me. <laughs> now, flash forward about 20 years. And my mother is in that role of being a caregiver for her mother. And she's saying, you know, my mom just worries about everything. <laughs> If I get to be that way when I'm her age, somebody just shoot me. Now, I've got the brains not to say it because somebody might just take me up on the offer. <laughs> but it's a funny thing about life, you know, and I'm actually not a warrior, but I do find in life that you can tend to obsess about stuff the older you get more and more. And for me, it's not worry, perhaps, as much as, you know, somebody will do something and, you know, especially if it's somebody does something that I feel wrong, somebody I care about, okay? Boy, that one's a, that's, that's the tough one for me. If somebody does something that I feel is an offense to one of my kids, then, man, it's just, if I let it, I will stew on that for hours, if not days, and just have to fight and fight my mind. But, boy... That's where I need to not let that happen. I need to choose to think the word. To let go and let God. You know, let go and let God. And that's just one example of all the many, many ways. The many, many ways where we have to be temperate. Where we have to exercise that control. That control to think the word. To live the word. To practice the word. Well, ultimately we're doing it, as I said to stand at the Bema and to receive rewards. And that's where we'll close in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy 4, verse 8, and verse 6. It says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul is saying, that he's getting to the close of his life. He knew that that time was about to come. I have fought a good fight. Mm -hmm. I have fought a good fight. I have put forth every ounce of my strength in this contest, in this fight. Mm -hmm. I have finished my course. Everything that God gave him to do, he was faithful to see it through. That took some discipline. You know, that took him having trained himself to be able to do it. It took him receiving training in the first place. It took him continuing to train himself. And along the way, part of what he was called to do was to train others. That was part of that course. I have kept the faith, the family faith. Henceforth, for that reason, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord... The righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Mm. You see, <clears throat> that's what we look forward to. The ultimate measure of our success in doing that training is when we stand before God and he gives us those crowns. It's what we should kind of picture. That's what life is about. It's more than just this stuff. And how sad it would be if the stuff was all that life was. I don't care how good it is. First of all, it's just too short. <laughs> it's just too short. And secondly, you know, it's as good as it is. It's just not all that it will be. What it will be will be so much more. Eternity is a lot longer, and how you spend it is a lot greater. But not just for what we will have in eternity, but for our thankfulness beyond that, our thankfulness for God's love and graciousness, that he would give us all of that. We want to be able to stand before him and know that we have fought a good fight. We have kept the faith. We have done what God has asked us to do. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you, God, for the life that you've called us to. I thank you, God, 
that we can live it to the fullest, that we can enjoy life, and that we can be found well-pleasing to you. We thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.